and welcome to Viking TV with me, Gabby Hadar, where I promise you that today we're going to get your taste buds positively drooling. Why? Because we've been invited into the home of the legendary Italian cook, Valentina Harris, the author of more than 30 cookbooks, including some that I guard very preciously in my own kitchen, Risotto Risotto for One, and the Italian regional cookbook, which no home cook worth their salt should be without. Valentina moved here to the UK from Rome in the 1970s and she has devoted her entire life to teaching and sharing her passion for Italian food. And now she's doing that for Vikings clients with a new series of programmes, Valentina's Culinary Voyages, inspired by her own recent voyage on the Italian sojourn itinerary, which takes in the wonderful destinations including Rome, Naples, Sicily, Venice, Crotone and Bari. You can look forward to seeing Valentina cook everything from risotto di gamberi to ossobuco, vitello tonato and tiramisu with limoncello. I can't wait to watch those episodes, Valentina, but today is all about getting to know you, the woman behind the food. And we'd love to hear the story of your life and where you found your inspiration both for cooking and obviously teaching, which has been a huge part of your life. Um, your lovely book, um, Fiora di Zucchi, uh, di Zucca, excuse me, um, is a mix of memoir and also wonderful recipes. Um, but it's so special to be able to sit down with you personally uh, and tell us here your fascinating story from you. So can you take us right back to the beginning and tell us where your, you know, the, about the family that you were born into and about your childhood. Of course. So um, my mum and dad met at the end of the war. Uh, my father was this fine, upstanding British Army officer and my mother was a sort of resistance fighting, gun running, fake passport printing <laughs> Amazing uh, patriot. And um, they met and it was the most unusual, you know, unlikely union really but they, they're quite an exotic they were quite an exotic mix weren't they yeah you know my father was half irish half dutch and my mother was half italian half belgian uh and you know they met in these extraordinary circumstances in immediate post-war italy and this enormous love affair was born and they settled in italy and uh, my three brothers were born, all born in Italy. And then my father was always very peripatetic. You know, he'd left school at 11 and had always sort of drifted from one thing to another thing. And, you know, he would have a brilliant idea and execute it and then sell that business on and then we'd move on to something else. And so we were always sort of on the move. We were very nomadic. Um, but the one sort of focal point was uh, my mother's house in Tuscany. Mm which was an old family property in Tuscany. And that was, you know... I mean, your, your mother just had come from quite noble um, stock, yes. hadn't she? Oh, yes. My mother was, was very much... A, was, was a true aristocratic noblewoman with, with title and everything. A very, very long name, too. Um, which also, you know, one of the things we had to do was, you know, we, we had a sort of annual visit to the Pope because that was sort of part of being who she was, was that, you know, there had to be this Vatican visit and everything. So, yeah, you know, there was all that baggage yes. uh, of, yes. of being of being um, that sort of an aristo. Anyway, so um, um, they this house was, as I say, the focal point mm. of everything. And uh, I arrived at La Tambura, there's a painting of it actually up over the door just here. Um, when I was 10 days old, because I was born in Berkshire <laughs> when, when my dad was in the middle of one of his many you know, projects yes. uh, and was running some kind of a summer college for uh, Italian kids to learn English in Maidenhead of all places. Oh, wow. And my mother, uh, you know, somewhere in her 40s, went into labour and uh, had me at home, uh, you know, with the car loaded, ready to go back to Italy. Because as far as my father was concerned, you know, the, 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 the project was over and it was time to move on, you know. So baby or no baby. Can you imagine, you know, that journey across Europe in that car with all those kids and my very, very old, very, very blue-blooded grandmother... Mm. 
and my mum and my dad, you know. I mean, it must, like, just four days after giving birth, you know, just unbelievable. Anyway, I was 10 days old when we landed at La Tambura, and uh, the person who greeted me was Bepino, who was our caretaker, who had been living in amongst the ruins of the house at the end of the war, and had been found there by he, my he parents. He was a refugee, wasn't he? He was, well, it, well, not so much a refugee as, you know, one of many Italian soldiers who weren't quite sure whose side we were on, because, you know, without mass communication, yeah. it was hard to know who'd won, so... They just sort of stayed where they were. Yeah. So he was a sort of adopted up. by your, yes, your family. Yes, he'd been sort of adopted by the family and he helped to rebuild the house and put the roof back on and build vegetable garden and um, look after the vineyard and, you know, and all of all of those things. And, and he was the man that greeted us at the gate. And I, at 10 days old, was plonked into this man's arms. And that was it. You know, this, this man became my, my, my the centre of my universe. Oh. As I grew up, he, I, I followed him around and he taught me about, you know, growing food and creating food. And it turned out he had been the head chef at a very famous Milanese restaurant before the war. Or rather, not the head chef, but the chef in charge of risotto making before the war. So this is sort of the idyll in which we all grew up, you know, um, dividing our time between this, this Tuscan place and... Sa Somewhere else in Italy, which often changed according to my father's <laughs> mood and, you know, where we were going. Um, and then, you know, we'd all be back in England for a bit and then we'd... All, and this was... But that house was, was the central place with Bepino there, you know, I mean, solid. Before we... Count, because people will be thinking, if, if they haven't heard you speak before, and you're obviously you're Italian, Italian, but your English is so beautiful, how you speak... Um, I, I'm coming. I'm coming to explain it. Why? Why the Radio Four voice? You know, because uh, people really do think that I'm going to sound like Gina Da Campo's mother. You yes, know? And then yes. I open my mouth and start speaking, and I actually sound like the Queen. And it, it's like, <laughs> you know, what's going on here? How can she be an Italian food expert and sound like this? So, you know, there we all are, living this, you know, beautiful life in in Italy. And uh, my father, when I was about six or seven, I suppose became enormously homesick for England, okay. my England. Yeah. You know, suddenly the conversation turned to things that were you know, quite alien to us, like lawns uh, and, <laughs> the lawn, and the pub and, and, and cricket and all sorts of things that you know, had never, we'd never really considered. You know, I was this feral child with a lizard in her pocket who knew everything about gutting rabbits and, and growing artichokes. And suddenly, we, you know, we're having conversations about queuing and, you know. Yeah. Very odd. It's anyway, strange. It was far too late. You know, we'd all, we'd all, we'd all, we, never, we were never going to be nice, polite English children, you know. Um, we're far too emotional, apart from anything else. You know, we're, we, you know, we, we cry in public. It's, you know, it was... <laughs> But you got your formative years were so you know, yes. in this heart of this beautiful Tuscan. So Dad house. decided it was going to be you know he was going to teach us to sound as English as he possibly could, and right. he did this yeah. with the BBC World Service, that venerable institution that is the BBC World Service, and he would he had shortwave band radio and he would tune it in for hours you know with all this wee wee whistling and you know. The, and then you, know, this is London, would happen, and and, you and know, well, the effect it, it's worked, hasn't it? Completely, you... well, it works really well. You lock your children in a room with with the radio <laughs> tuned to the World Service, and a few weeks later, they all emerge sounding like this. The weird thing about it, Gabby, is that I sound like a person that I don't feel I am. Yeah. Yeah. And that's well, a real. And you are. I mean, having spent time with you, you know, you are Italian in your gestures and how you think and how you feel and and exactly. certainly how you cook. So, yeah. but but you have this lovely, uh, very English delivery. Exactly. But back to the food. So this rather sort of very charming, quite chaotic sort of childhood with yes. you know children and and lots of people and grandparents and so on. And my and, parents and constantly celebrating the fact that they'd met and let's have another party. And, you know, lo and a lovely love affair, loving parents. Oh, absolutely. And who who was 
Um, who was doing the cooking in in the house most of the well, time? Well, in it? Tuscany, it would have been Bepino mm -hmm. and his wife, yeah. Andreina, uh, aided and abetted by, you know, whoever. I mean, me, very small, you know, I'd sort of peer around the door because this is where all the action was. Yeah. I yeah. just was so drawn to these conversations about what was in season and what wasn't in season and what we were going to make and, you know, what we were not going to make and, oh, no, we haven't got enough of that to make that. And to me, this was absolutely riveting. Yes. So I'd sort of peep round the corner and always be pulled in. You know, there'd always be a job to do. There'd always be a welcome. And for me, sitting at that table or mm. often at the children's table because the big table would be taken up by the grown-ups and there'd be a second table and sometimes even a third table for the add-ons, like the kids, um, when something came into the dining room to be served and I knew I had had a part in it, that sense of instant gratification, which is what drives every chef, was, was there. You know, was born. You know, chefs don't do so their how, job. How old were you the, you know, the first time you were sort of in there? Helping Beppino stir oh, the pot. Four, or five? Tiny then, tiny. really. Yeah, so your, yeah. your very earliest memories then are in the, the kitchen. Absolutely, um, absolutely. My very earliest memories are not only in the kitchen, but that feeling at the table. Because, you know, let's face it, most chefs don't do the job because it's good for their health or their income or their, <laughs> or their arches or their marriage or their social life. They do it for the buzz. Yeah. Yes. That's what keeps them there. Mm. Mm. And there are very few things in life that give you that instant buzz as putting down a plate of food and getting the feedback from somebody who, who appreciates it, whether they've paid it's for it. It's probably like whether... being an actor on stage, isn't it? Where you, it's the applause yeah. the, and, and joy and you're, you're, yes. you're giving people joy. So around this table, fairly regularly, there were big gatherings of... Oh, it was completely of... normal that there'd be 20, 30 people. You know, my mother would wonder... My mother was an art historian and, you know, not, not the most practical of people generally, but when it came to planning, you know, these meals, you know, she'd always have lists with, you know, and muttering about, you know, shall we have asparagus or, you know, is that extravagant? And, you know, and then we'd do these fishing trips, you know, down... Bipino would decide... That you know, the, the, the whatever the star, moon and stars and wind were all aligned <laughs> correctly, and at 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 sunset we'd all go down to the beach, which was you know, literally in front of the house, and drop these nets on a rowing boat, uh, in in these horseshoes, and then the sun would set, uh, and then in the morning Bipino would all wake us all up, and we'd go down to the beach really, really, really early when only the nuns were having their swims all the local nuns would swim wow. in knitted knitted swimwear with their with these very special wow. wimples on the sea was always full of nuns early in the morning and our nets what an and we memory. would um we'd sit you know each one would be given a bucket each participant would yeah. be given a bucket and the nets would be pulled in and, and moved from hand to hand and we'd only take whatever fish we'd been assigned so you know, you might be the person in charge of all the flatfish and you yeah. might be the person in charge of all the squid and you might be the person in charge of whatever. And that's what we put into our bucket so that it was easier to assess... What you call... What we were going to make next. Mm. What, mm. Well, what the grown-ups were going to make next, you know, from this from melange how, in the so, bucket. So, I mean, literally from almost from first thing in the morning to obviously last thing in the evening... It would, the whole culture then of your family was around the meals and around the table, kind of. Oh, only for me. Yeah. I mean, there, there, were, there were lots of other family members who just ate. <laughs> <laughs> you know, who were just happy to. I you know my big brothers were are all very good cooks, mm. and still to this day insist that they're much better cooks than I am, and let them believe. They're winding it. you up. That's what brothers that's do. That's fine. You know, that's yeah. fine. But. Uh, you know, they 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 cook. You know, sometimes themselves. You know, I can remember my brother deciding to make lobster bisque. I think there was lobster shell as far as the eye could see for weeks. You know, <laughs> you have to pound them in a vessel of water. 
Very easy. Uh, but yeah, you know, there were lots of, there was a lot of other things. So, there, and they were very keen surfers. And of course, nobody surfs yeah. in Italy ever, really. Especially not on the Tuscan coast. But, you know, they there were even local postcards, you know, actual official postcards you could buy in shops of my brother's surfing. <laughs> They were to- they were tourist attraction. <laughs> tourist attraction. <laughs> because they'd go out, you know, when the sea was so rough and, you know, red flags flying. Amazing. And they'd be out there. And then, you know. and meanwhile, you were just drawn to this, the, the, the I whole... I was just... The, yeah, I know, think it was whole... greed. I think, and purely, ca- frankly, ca- it was <laughs> greed. Because, you know... Um, but, yeah, you know, I was just... And then I opened my own restaurant in the, in the, in the family sandpit. Mm. And, uh, and you know, my parents, when I was 10, they gave me some camping gas stoves and gas cylinders and matches. I mean, nowadays oh, they'd you be wouldn't arrested. Do that now. Yes. Be arrested. <laughs> um, but, you know, then, you know, and I was able to then spend pocket money on actually, you know, learning to cook. And so can you, can you remember um, uh, the first thing, the first dish that you ever, you ever cooked and you thought, that that you prepared yourself from from scratch yes i think i think i can and it was in the sand pit and i managed not to get too much sand in it which was you know quite good it was a scalopina it was a you know a, a meat tossed in flour and then cooked in butter with lemon juice and and uh and, and fresh herbs from the garden Fantastic. which i made for my mother oh, it sounds delicious and how old would you have been at that time i would have been round about 10 yeah okay. amazing yeah. So you're you're there you're cooking away and did the family just think this is great we've got we've got our own chef in the family and start you know. oh no 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 not not really no there was always so much going on you know I mean it, you know the fact that I had this passion for cooking was you know they were they were very sweet about it mm. and they were very polite about it and you know very encouraging but you know then a career in food particularly for the for a woman yes. Was really and what about Beppino? Did he nurture your talent? Did he think absolutely, mm. absolutely? But in a very quiet, very you know, he knew, he knew, he knew that I had got it mm. because he had experienced that buzz that we I was talking about yes. before. That that the reason why you want to do it, mm. not because you have to, mm. you know. Well, it is because you have to, but what drives you to stay there is that buzz. And he yes. knew that I'd felt that. And uh, and that's what we shared, you know. How lovely. And also that you felt it kind of every... It's not one of those things... Sometimes as a kid, you know, you, you do something once and you get a buzz from it and then you move on to the next thing. But for you, it continued as, a, you know, for, on a, a sort of fairly regular basis. You got yeah. that buzz every time yeah. you served yeah, yeah, yeah. something. At the moment when I turned 18 and the moment had come to go to uni, mm. uh, I had my place at uni. I, I, I was going to come to England. I was moving to England to go to university, to Warwick. Yeah. And, um, and then I... And then what, this, what was the plan? What were you going to study? I was going to study Italian literature. Mm. Mm. And uh, I, uh, I, 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 you know, my mother... I think my mother realised that the last of her children was leaving home. Mm. And she, as a Tuscan, you know, was very Machiavellian. And she began to talk about <laughs> this place <laughs> in Rome that was running these cookery courses. That for the first time, they were cookery courses that were sort of open to you know, sort of anybody. Yes. Yeah. And uh, she said, you know, and I've noticed how much you enjoy cooking and you know, you're quite into it. You know, how about it? So I went and did this sort of, and I was totally... And do you think hooked. that's because she wanted to keep you in Italy? Or because she knew that your real passion she, was, was, or both, a mixture? A bit, a bit of each, yeah. you know. She wanted, she wanted to keep her baby. Yeah. But she also... That worked. <laughs> <laughs> that worked. <laughs> But she, uh, but you know, she also, you know. But then, anyway, then, then the problem is that yeah. You know, so I started doing this course, and was absolutely totally hooked. Okay. I mean, you know, so you love safety it. out the window. You know, lesson one, we had chainsaws and chain, and you know, we were dissecting a cow. 
Oh my it's goodness! It's extraordinary, extraordinary to learn what the different cuts were. I mean, it was really out there. Yeah. Well, what ahead was the of name the of the school? It was called George's. Yeah. And uh, and it was yeah, it was a, a three year you know thing I did. And uh, I mean, I loved it. I just went on doing more and more courses. Uh, and then that summer, I met a friend of my brother's. Mm. And I think her name was coming. <laughs> well, I mean, I just thought this was it. Yeah. How old were you at this point? Eighteen. 18. So and, first uh, time in love. Absolutely convinced that this was, you know, it. it. And don't forget. Now, I have been brought up with two people who madly exhibit <laughs> their madly in loveness at every opportunity, all the time, yeah. and have been, you know, did so for 50 odd years. So, you know, I knew what real love was all about. This was it, you know, and yeah. this was, you know. So, uh, so, brother's friend was from England. Yeah, he was, he was. <laughs> so, you know. So he up. goes back after the summer and what summer. happens with you? And I announce to all and sundry that I am going to, that this is the one and that, you know, I must follow my, my I must follow my heart. Mm. You've got to follow your heart. So you, and did you, you quit your course? Well, in, I, I, there was a hiatus between, okay. you know, one part of the course and another bit of it starting. So I was able to sort of, you know, juggle it slightly. <laughs> and... <laughs> And uh, I turned up on his doorstep and, I mean, all I can say is that it, if he'd been an Italian man, the first thing he would have done is to phone my parents and say, and come say and get you know, her. please come and get your not your crazy daughter. But being English, you know, you guys are so polite about these things and you, know, you don't like these sort of confrontations, you know. So we sort of cohabited in this very tiptoe around sort of, very polite, kind of way. <laughs> and so you were besotted and he was... I was utterly besotted. Uh, yeah. uh, but there was no way in the world I was going home to tell everybody I'd made a terrible mistake. You know, I had to finesse this in some other mm. way. So I started doing a bit of cooking. Largely because, you know, it got me away, it got me out of the house, it got yes. me doing things. And gradually, gradually, I built up this reputation I built up this reputation for being somebody who cooked authentic real Italian food. Yeah, which at the time, and this was 1970s. This was this the 70s I and mean, early 80s. I mean, for anybody watching, uh, the food in England and the UK at that time was absolutely terrible, wasn't it? I mean, I, you know, I, I'm, I was, was a child of the 70s and we were living on fish fingers and chips and a angel of delight for dessert. Yeah. So it was, it, you know, unless you were prepared to pay a lot of money for food yes. um, in very swish restaurants. Everybody else ate pretty kind of... Carbs and, um, yeah, tasteless. Uh, yeah. <laughs> tasteless I mean, grey food probably is the... I yeah. remember phoning my mother to tell her that, you know, somebody just poured a tin of ravioli on top of a piece of toast for me. Uh, you know, and, and I knew that people were doing this... Mm. To help, to stop me crying, really, because, you know, I was crying all the time because I was so homesick. And, oh. you know, the, people would make me these Italian things to eat, <laughs> to, you know, yeah. cheer me up and make me less homesick. And, you know, honestly, it just made it all worse. Anyway, I was then going back and so forth. You, you, but you were cooking and people were saying, oh, my God, this food, this food, which yeah, is a know, ray of you, sunshine. What's for... gnocchi, you know? Mm, mm. No, no, really exotic. Like, oh yes, and look, and there are all these different versions of it, and you know, paste or things that now are taken absolutely for granted. Yeah. You know. Anyway, uh, I was then offered my first book, which was Perfect Pasta, which was translated into fifteen languages and won lots of awards and put me right on the map. And uh, then and I was how, offered... how old were you when that was published? Um, uh, that, well, that was 1983, 84. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, my and, mid you, By this stage, had you got a job in a professional kitchen? Uh, I was you freelancing, you freelancing here and there. So you were working... Uh, and, and I was doing a lot of private chef work yes. for people who yes. were sort of going, oh, wow. This is know, amazing. Gnocchi. 
<laughs> what's gnocchi here we go you know and and writing that that first book did that writing, were, you, were you surprised about that did that you know i was absolutely it? blown away mm. by you know i had a uh, i had by this point got married um i was i was married not to, to the man you followed no <laughs> i was married to, i was married to bob harris you know old gray whistle test bob yes so my world was very different, you know, there was, you know, very much the world of, you know, music and rock and roll. And we, we had a, a, a son, my first son, mm. and he was one when I started writing uh, Perfect Pasta. And as I say, that followed on, it followed on, it followed on. And then I was asked to write a book, a very significant book, mm. was book number five, which which is called Edible Italy. Mm which really for the first time identified how different the cuisine of the 20 regions of Italy really is mm. Mm. and really went into that in some depth. And out of that, I was offered my Italian regional cookery. Yeah, BBC which is one of the ones that, I mean, that TV is series? such an amazing, the book's amazing, the TV series was amazing. Yeah. And that really... I mean, that, that took, in this country, Italian food to the next level because people, it wasn't just pizza and pasta. Yeah. It's like you really educated people yes, um, yes. Ar around the, the complexity. And I did it first. <laughs> <laughs> it has been done since, but I did it no, first. No, you did it first. And, and I mean, I was, I'm mm. still the only woman who did it. You know? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, because, uh, you know, one thing that is often overlooked is that during that period of the 70s and 80s, when I was really striving mm. as a sort of self-made ambassadress for Italian food, for real Italian food yeah. and, and real Italian producers and, and, you know, telling people about the history behind the products. And that's what fascinates me, you know, is the stories behind the dishes and behind the yes. products and everything that goes on behind it. And this is how I carved my niche but I was I was doing that as a woman mm. in a very male dominated business absolutely you know? yeah yeah um, I mean all the big chefs at that all time the big they were chefs, all men weren't they but also TV mm. and 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 media generally was you know very very you know so it was it was a double thing did, you, did know? you love doing it did you you absolutely kind of, yeah. love doing it absolutely love doing it I mean it. I think that's the other thing it, it's not just the dishes you've always wanted to teach other people about food and and I mean you're not gonna always die, you know it is about education but you want to bring people along into the, the well, love of it well I believe mm. absolutely believe mm. that you can only really get to know a place through your taste buds mm. because what's on your plate is going to tell you so much more about the history the geography the climate the sociology of where you are mm. than any guidebook mm. you know it's I mean, right it's, it, there it's very interesting actually because in a way you were a long way ahead of your time then because in the 80s people were getting ingredients from all around the world certainly yeah. in the uk and and you know fusion became a thing and you were talking about the provenance of ingredients and and sustainability decades before Absolutely. it became the thing you know i i think that that's sort of not to be underestimated yeah. but that those things, I think, right from the beginning yes, were very yes. important to yeah, you, weren't they? Absolutely. So the message with the teaching, I've always said, you know, I, anybody can teach you how to make something, how to follow a recipe. Mm. But what I'm hoping you're going to get out of me, mm. as opposed to anybody else, mm. is yes, you will learn how to make that dish. But I'm also going to tell you about the story behind it, the place that it comes from. You're going to get a, a flavour and a sense of the place mm. so when i opened my cookery school in my tiny little blink and you miss it village <laughs> up in the appian alps in the apennines actually yeah at the end of the appian alps beginning of the apennines that was extraordinary because you know now, now i had a place where people could come and stay and I could grab them by the hand and take them to this and show them this and, you know, make them really immerse themselves as yes. I have always been. And yes. everybody that left, you know, left with this tremendous sense of having really fallen in love with Italy mm. and with Italian culture through its food. Mm. Mm. Um, and yes, there are lots of other parts of the world that are produce amazing food and is delicious, but nowhere else has 20 
such disparate separate regions with such a clear history yes and such diversification because we were only unified in the 1860s so actually we're a very young country mm, mm. and prior to that you know the fact that up north there isn't a lot of bread for instance traditionally yeah. traditionally they don't produce a lot of bread it, or olive oil it's, you think to yourself why is that well well you know never seen an olive tree or a wheat field growing in the dolomites or the apennines you know yeah you see it's uh, fascinating because outside of italy you ask people you know tell me about italian food they'd say pasta pizza olive oil probably yeah. and and that would be but uh, you know the the finesse of each regional cookery and now i'm going to ask you a a tough question now, which is if, if you had to put one region above all others in your heart, is, is, is it Tuscany or is that just an impossible question? Um, in my heart, mm. it's probably Tuscany because that's where I grew up. But from a culinary perspective, nothing can beat Sicily. OK. Because Sicily has belonged, in its history, mm. has belonged to everybody. You know, it's passed from hand to hand to hand over time. And everybody has left its mark on the food. Uh, and it it's like a history book yeah. to me, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, just ice cream. You know, ice cream was invented or cr first created on the island of Sicily during the Arab domination using the snow from the peaks of Etna. Amazing, Brought I didn't Brought down... Know that. To the flatlands in these sacks made out of camel stomachs, horse stomachs, cow stomachs, one inside the other, inside the other, inside the other, to create a sort of very early form of a thermos flask. <clears throat> and then, which would keep somehow this, uh, this snow slushy, and they called it Shabbat. Sorbet. Amazing. I've never heard that. No. So when you go to Sicily and you're eating ice cream, you were really eating history, you know. And uh, and there are things like that literally all over the country that make wonderful stories. And I'm a storyteller. Yes, yes. You know. But I mean, you're, you are, you, you said you're the first woman to do it, the only woman. And, you know, you brought these stories and you've, how, I mean, thousands of people now you on your courses and and yeah. through your schools and through your tv programs i mean you've got now got ambassadors for italian cuisine <laughs> probably all around the world through well you know what whenever i i get you know it all it happens to all of us you know that you have days where you think oh you know oh really you know what i get out you know what is my pick me up i get my guest books out mm. and i read about what my my, my guests wrote the guests that came to that cookery school high up in those hills in that little village of 39 registered inhabitants you know we oh, when we arrived how, how many years did you have the school i for? i was there for three or four years mm. and then very sadly through no fault of my own the water supply became contaminated to the village to the whole village mm. and i went to the authorities and i said okay <laughs> <laughs> Che <laughs> facciamo? This is my livelihood, and they went, ah, you know, ah, it's only a small village, you know. No, 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 you don't understand. This is my, you know, this is this is everything. This is everything. Ah, oh, you know, we'll bring in stands, and you know, we'll get mineral water. I said, no, no, you don't understand. <laughs> How long is it going to take to fix this? And they said, in the end, they said, oh, it'll be 10 years. Oh. So I had to go. You know, I had yeah, to, your I had heart to leave. must have broken about that. Uh, my heart, actually. But you're very good, Valentin. You picked yourself up and then you, you, found a, you found a new way, didn't you? There's always pasta. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know. and, you, you know, and you've, you've gone on to, in the UK then teaching people. Yes, um, absolutely, about, yeah. You know, ab about, food, about Italian yes. um, food and, and ingredients and recipes. Is there, you know, through all your career, all the 30 plus books, I think it's probably nearer 40 books, actually. I think it's now probably that... nearer 50 now. Is it nearer <laughs> 50? Sorry, no, I'm doing yeah, it. Yes, yeah. what's, yeah, 20 what? books here or there. Really? But is there, <laughs> is there, is it the Italian regional cookbook that still would make you proudest of all the, the books that you've written? Uh, yes, because it came out of that whole experience 
television experience, which was amazing. Because, you know, the BBC spent a year researching it, which meant that me and my producer-director would be sent out to Italy for these recce that Mm. lasted six weeks or so, where we would go to all these extraordinary places, you know, little dripping on toast equivalent, to discover these extraordinary local local recipes and talk to all these local people and everything and then come back and write the script and put it all together and then go out and do the next bit you know it was amazing. an amazing the experience detail. Yeah. and I, I will forever be so grateful to the BBC for giving me that opportunity to really have the opportunity to go out there and touch and taste and explore and meet those How people fantastic. and see those things I mean, which I would never have done otherwise I probably. mean I think um, travel. I mean, it's always been important to you, have, hasn't it? You know that obviously oh. that book. But you know, you've also mentioned before we started. You, you spent some time in Australia um, because there's obviously a huge Italian community yes. out there. Yes. Well, you know, uh, when the TV series was on Australian mm. television, they sent me out to tour, mm. and uh, and that that was amazing. You know, Australia, New Zealand, uh, going from, here, from place to place cooking recipes from the from the book and 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 talk to people about uh, you know Italian food exactly and interesting to see how it's developed Italian food in the different places around the, you know in Australia New Zealand in America yes. obviously there's a you know a huge Italian community out there yes. and they sort of develop the food depending on what they can get hold of yeah. in those countries yeah um, does that excite you seeing how the food totally is... I remember we were in Sydney at a frightfully smart, you know, four-star Sydney Harbour Hotel, five-star Sydney Harbour Hotel. And they they had arranged for me to do a series of banquets for invited guests. Uh, the first night was Northern Italian food, night two was Central Italian food, and then the third night was the South. And they had various people in the audience. There were hundreds of people to this thing. I mean, just like mind-blowing now looking back. At the time, it was just plain terrifying, you know. But And uh, there was this guy who was one of the very early olive oil producers in in um, in Australia. And he, he was talking about how he reckoned that the, that the original olive groves of Australia had arrived because immigrants fleeing Italy during the mm. diaspora around mm. about just before, just after, and continuing on the unification when Italy was, you know, in oh. pretty dire straits. Um, they had probably brought olives with them and they dropped them on the ground, you know. They just sort oh, of, wow. fall, you know, eaten them and got rid of the olive pits. And this is how the olive grows had sort of started, uh, from wild olives that just just grew, and now Amazing. you know, look at it. You know, Australia is one of the forty-four countries that produces olive oil on our planet. Good olive oil. Mm. Well, we have three hundred and ninety-six different varieties of olives that that grow. I mean, it's an enormous it? it's subject. Incre- yeah. Yes. Yes. In forty-four different countries, mm. you know, mm. and uh, uh, I mean that's what's exciting in a way, isn't it? That the fact that Italian. Um, Because, you know, you've developed it because I although you're very much rooted in all those regions of Italy and really do your research, you still put a bit of a twist on or, you know, you can modernise food while still respecting where it came from and and the heritage, still giving it a little modernity in some way. Yeah, absolutely. For me, you know, if if we don't move, we die, don't we? I mean, whatever you're in. You ha- whatever industry has to evolve, has to move, and, and food and cooking has to move and has to evolve. But there are lines. Yeah. There are lines you don't cross. Yes. Like frying gnocchi. Okay, yeah. next time I see that on a menu, I will not like, use it. you know, putting balsamic into your olive oil at the table. Okay, that's a big no. No, okay. Having a cappuccino at dinner time. No. Okay, I think we need a rule book. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, do what you like. I'm not going to, you know, but I will be disapproving. Yes. Quietly. Yes. I'm going to be very careful before we go out for dinner together. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> but obviously, we're, I mean, we were talking about travel there. Um, you know, and it's been very important to you in the research yes. in your career. Um, obviously, you've recently been on a, a cruise with Viking, I know, I know. Um, the so Italian exciting. sojourn um, oh. itinerary. Um, can you t share with us some of your memorable highlights from from that from that cruise? Well, the biggest highlight of all, without question, was the tour of the kitchens. I on the ship. So, the, which ship were you on? You were I on was the... on the Jupiter. Yeah. I mean, you know, by the time I went below deck into what is <laughs> laughingly called the galley, I mean, you know, I've worked as a chef on board boats before, and that was no galley. <laughs> you know, galley is like. <laughs> shoebox that you that you work in but these were incredible i mean it's the literally the whole length and 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 width of the ship is taken up with these preparation and cooking areas amazing by the time i i went i had eaten a few times so mm. i had already assessed that we were talking incredible quality of yes. food amazing technique and you know to achieve that a float. Yes. Yeah, incredible. The quality is in incredible. So yes. was it was it going to see the food that, that tempted you to go on the, the ship or the fact that it was going to the destinations that are really close to your heart? Well, I'd never been to Messina properly. Mm. And when I saw that we were going to go to Messina, I mean, I know Sicily a bit. And as I've said, I'm, I'm fascinated by the cuisine. Yeah. But so the opportunity to... To see Messina. Yeah, so uh, if I, if I, it, I mean, you'd say, you know, a highlight of a destination, that would be, you know. Messina, yes. I know, I know it's difficult because you love and, them all. Uh, but... And Crotone. Yeah. Crotone yeah. is incredible. You know, it's this blink and you miss it port in, in Calabria. Mm. So many people overlook mm. Calabria. Mm. But for me, I've holidayed a lot in Calabria, archaeologically, Culturally, it's incredibly rich. You know, it, it, Crotone is where Pythagoras had his his school of philosophy and mathematics. For goodness' sake, you know, you can't yes. can't get more sort of, you know. And and the archaeological museum is wonderful, and there's a fabulous street market, and it's off the beaten track. And and I just love how it. fantastic and what a brilliant itinerary that you get to do the the sort of highlights of you know Venice and yeah. Rome that everybody who goes to Italy really wants to see those places but you also get to go to these places that absolutely you might not even have really thought about before no um, and and these places need us mm, mm. you know Rome doesn't need us <laughs> <laughs> Venice doesn't need us wonderful to go but you know they don't really need us yeah you know Crotone. I think there were 47 British people visited Crotone last year. 47. So what an opportunity for a, as a passenger on that on that itinerary incredible, to go and, incredible. and see that place. And also in Calabria, we went to a family farm uh, to visit them. And this was a sort of 17th century idyll, this hamlet with oh. its own little its own little chapel you know and, and, and amazing beautiful fantastic place which who knew has got a one-star Michelin restaurant run by the youngest daughter of the family using produce from the farm you know I mean it's just amazing and their olive oil well you know I have tasted a lot of olive oil in the course of my yes. life yes this olive oil it's the only thing I brought home in my suitcase how exciting that you still you're going to these places and the cruise you know facilitated that and tasting things that you've never tasted be tasted before yes, yes. Um, yeah and that, that was actually one of my and how about any dishes that really knocked your socks off that you, you haven't tried before on that trip was there um I don't think there was anything new so to speak but but you know, I I I gravitated to Manfredi's. <laughs> oh, on the ship. On so the ship. yes, yeah. Oh, it's fantastic. Restaurant. Because yeah. you know, oh, I know what there was actually. Yes, there was something that I ate that I hadn't come across before in Messina. Uh, we tasted. Was it in Messina? Or was it in Calabria? Anyway, somewhere we tasted a sort of fish version. Of Nduya, you know, everybody goes on and on about Nduya. Yeah. It's it's a it's a very 
trendy ingredient. Yes. I hate that word, but yes. <laughs> it's it a very... is. Everybody's just discovered yeah. it. Well, yeah. You know, it's been going on for millennia yes. because there wasn't anything else and because, you know, chilli was a good way of preserving pork, etc., etc., etc. But, it, you know, let's brush over all of that. It currently is a very, a very trendy, in. very yeah. in ingredient. And there was a fishy version. Same sort of thing, you know, spreadable, fishy, uh, very, very hot with chilli. Oh, wow. Which they seemed to think was completely normal. And I thought, oh, I don't think anybody... <laughs> Suddenly nobody in Shoreditch is no. using <laughs> that. How <laughs> <stuff. laughs> <laughs> interesting. Yeah. So inspiration in all these places. Yeah. I know that... I mean, I, I won't get you short because you're obviously you're doing your series about yes. the dishes, but each destination on the itinerary has inspired you to create a dish that you're going to be sharing in the in the series, which people must watch those because you're, yes, you're, you know, you're showing how Well, to what them. I've done is I've actually chosen some of the dishes are dishes that celebrate the places and some of them are my recreations of things that frankly blew my socks off on board. On the ship, yeah. I just, you know, it it is so refreshing because... In Italy now, there is this new, again, trend uh, that is uh, that is about fine dining in Italian food, you know. And it, it I don't know who it's aimed at, mm. but for us who don't have the opportunity to live in Italy, when we come to Italy, we want to find those dishes that we know and love so well just better because you know we're in yes. Italy we don't need everything we don't need our tiramisu discon deconstructed or you know it, it, it's it, and you smears on the plate we just too. want it really good you know and um, that is tending to happen less and less in Italian restaurants yes. because the new young chefs that are coming in want to do something new and different mm -hmm. and so they put smears on the plate and they add foam and they deconstruct and they you know they add a weird ingredient that no no, no italian nonna would ever have dreamt of using yeah etc but in manfredi's it yeah. was like going back but not if you know what i yes, mean yes. this classic italian food beautifully cooked with a little twist yes yeah. And then just enough of a twist to bring it to make to, it modern. to make it now and i mean that in your series will be what people can you know learn how to recreate your versions of those dishes yeah. at home which is i mean that's i'm yeah. really excited about that now, i'm going to be really dastardly now because i really would encourage everybody to go to those programs and see right. how to watch those but I'm now going to put you on a desert island and I'm only going to allow you one ingredient, Valentina. One so ingredient? One ingredient. One ingre I mean, there may be things growing on the island, okay. but if your most precious ingredient that you've absolutely got to have with you, what, what would that be? Well, let's assume that there are tomatoes, yes. at least, we'll assume, okay. growing <laughs> on the island. <laughs> um I think they'd have to be two ingredients, really. Okay. Yep. Well, and it would have to be good bread mm. and olive oil, because mm. mm. you can survive anything with bread and olive oil, really. Mm. You know, good uh, olive oil is so incredibly good for you. And of course, on the island there might also be olive trees, and I might be able to press my own Your olives own. and make my own olive oil in time. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and then if I only will allow you to take to your island one piece of kitchen equipment. Oh, a knife. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, yeah. a good As knife. The true a good chef, knife is, is true everything. Sh chef's answer. So I'm gonna. Uh, you've got your knife. Yeah. And you've got your olive oil uh, or your pressing olives. I think I might just have to let you have a sack of rice as well because if I drop into this island, I mean, I love your book Risotto Risotto so much. Yes. And and that you really. In a way, it's a humble dish risotto, but it's next level, isn't it? When it's just such a great dish. People think risotto is easy to make. Anybody who says that risotto is easy to make has never made risotto, frankly. Mm. You know, mm. it's as simple as that. It is one of the most difficult things to get right. On board the ship in Manfredi's, did I ever 
sample some of the best results of ever. Incredible. Mm. You know, the, and as I say, you know, it's difficult enough to do to cook at that level on dry land. Pepino taught me how to make risotto. I can't make risotto without hearing his voice in my ear, you know, telling me what to look out for. And it is. I mean, anybody who thinks that risotto is easy, and, you know, has never made risotto. Mm. Never made a risotto if you think it's easy. This is... It's not difficult, but it's something that Takes requires care. your commitment. Mm. Um... You know, there are lots of disappointments already in life. Don't give yourself another one by making something that you're not committed to because it's, you know, if you're not in the mood, yeah. make something else. Yeah. You know, this, you need to be there. You can't walk away from the result or there's a relationship between you and that wooden spoon and what's happening in the pot. Mm. And, um, yeah, I mean, some of the best results I've ever eaten in my life, I I can say hand on heart, was what I ate at Manfredi's on the Jupiter. I've been incredible. Mm, mm. Knowing oh, how hard it is to make a risotto that well mm. on dry land in a kitchen where you have everything to hand. This is on a ship yeah. at sea. Uh. And they're turning out this kind of risotto? I mean, it was phenomenal. Amazing. Absolutely phenomenal. And, you know, they call me the risotto queen because, you know, I'm yeah, really well, you are. bang on yeah. about yeah. it. Well, and, and also, I can't wait to watch that episode where we, you're, we're, it's yes. your version of, uh, in, in English, prawn risotto. Yes. But, um, yeah, I mean, you, you say it in Italian for us. Cause you're risotto a... gamberi. Oh, lovely. Yeah, so I can't <laughs> wait to watch that. But yes. meanwhile, you've made me very, very hungry um, now, Valentina. And I think you've actually got a few little morsels for us to... Well, I th I was practicing, you know, the dishes that I'm going to be making uh, for the series. So I have two things for you to taste. I have a savoury thing and a sweet oh, thing. Great, great. So yeah, we can, oh, we can move Let's... on to that now. Fantastic, that sounds okay, great. Okay. Yes, please. <laughs> Okay, so Valentino, we actually get to try yes, something now. Do. So tell me, what so, are we starting with? So this is a caponata in celebration of Sicily. Caponata is an aubergine and pickle salad, really. It's a sweet and sour recipe. Uh, as I say to everybody when they go to Sicily, don't bother going to Sicily if you don't like aubergines, because <laughs> they are <laughs> everywhere. Eggplant for anybody watching from across the pond. But yes, it, it, you know, it is the vegetable of the island. So this is a little salad. I've put it on some crostini, which is just a piece of toasted bread. I've dressed it with uh, the fantastic olive oil from Ceraudo. Oh, fantastic. Which was our shore visit uh, in Calabria. Um, because so this would be your recommended, by, if anybody goes on that itinerary, You'd recommend they buy this? this. Is anything yeah. from Geraldo. <laughs> but their, you know, their jams are amazing. Their wines are incredible. But their olive oil. Next it's, level. It's mm. really outstanding. Anyway, so you can kind of drizzle a little tiny bit. Which one are you going to go for? Gonna uh, go for a, a big one. Let's a go big for one. it. Yeah, okay, fine. Okay, let's give you a little drizzle. There Look at that. And um, I like I'll the way you, you... You, you've chosen the small one. I've got the, the big one here. <laughs> well, I don't know what you might ask me to say. So, <laughs> no, I just want to have a smaller one. So, yeah. Um, here goes. Bon appetito. Bon appetito. That's absolutely, mm. absolutely delicious. I've lost a oh, bit. Oh, my goodness. I love it. And you're teaching us how to make this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I can't wait. Gorgeous. Mm. So, oh, if only you could taste this. You can have another one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was absolutely delicious, Valentina. I, I could eat them all. Good. But I know good. you've also prepared. <laughs> you prepared something uh, else. Well, for... I, I made a little tiramisu. This is a tiramisu wow, with lemon and strawberries. Oh, look at that. Um, it's a bit of an experiment, okay? I, I want your honest opinion. Mm. Because um, when I was making it for you today, mm. I realised I'd run out of limoncello. 
So I've used another form of booze in it. Oh, so I need to try and taste taste yeah, what that is. Tell me what you think. Oh, it's gorgeous. That is absolutely to die for. Oh, it's very fantastic. light, isn't it? It's really light. It's delicious. And again, you're doing an episode so so our viewers can see how to make this. Yes, with limoncello. With limoncello. Because I think the limon. I don't know, I think I quite like... Can you guess what it is? I'm trying to taste what it... It's quite... It's, it's... No, I don't know what it is. Quite sweet, it's... It's martini. <laughs> a martini yeah. tiramisu. <laughs> wow. It's, it's vermouth, basically. It's, it's absolutely delicious. And I love the way you served it in a little teacup. Mm -hmm. I think that's just the sweetest idea. Well... It works, doesn't it, it? It looks really lovely. And the fact it matches your dress is just... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the point is we've all got bits of china and things mm. in our cupboards mm. that we never use. But how so lovely. And to get them out. It. And also a really nice portion size. Not too big. Yeah. Really lovely, really lovely thing to serve. Well, I can't tell you how delicious it is. I am feeling like I'm back in Italy now. Well, bravo, benissimo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.